2020 marked the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution that finally granted women the right to vote. It took more than 70 years of difficulty and struggle, but the women and their supporters refused to give up. Few of the early suffragettes lived long enough to see the victory. In 1848, the women's suffrage movement officially began to organize with the Seneca Falls Convention in New York, where their Declaration of Sentiments was introduced. It called for women to fight for their constitutionally guaranteed right to equality as a citizen. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men and women are created equal. Topics covered by the Declaration included the lack of rights after marriage, the fact that child custody remained with the husband in the case of divorce, and the lack of right to college education. Lucretia Mott, one of the organizers of the convention and authors of their declaration, was a Quaker, suffragist, abolitionist, pacifist, and women's rights activist. Continuing through the 20th century, women's rights were very slowly expanded, including their right to own property and sign contracts. But the rights of married women were particularly limited. In New York, it was illegal for married women to own property, including the wages they earned. Husbands controlled the management of all property, and women had to obtain their husband's permission for business transactions. Amelia Bloomer was at the convention. She was an early suffragist, activist, and editor, and became the first woman to own a newspaper for women. She promoted change in women's fashions and advocated for clothing that was less restrictive than corsets and the customary 15 pounds of petticoats worn by women of the day. This was called the bloomer dress. Activists embraced this fashion, but found that in public, it distracted away from their platform. Following the Civil War, the 14th Amendment of 1868 established that anyone born in the United States was a citizen, but explicitly only applied to men. At the very first state convention of 1869, Texas rejected the right to vote for women, saying it was unwomanly. In 1870, the 15th Amendment passed, which was challenged to the United States Supreme Court. Their interpretation held that voting was not a right of citizenship, but that individual states could decide who was eligible and who was ineligible to vote. At that point, there became a division in the suffragist organizations, some thinking that the priority was a national women's suffrage amendment and some believing that it better to pursue suffrage within each state. Many states allowed women to vote in some elections, but not others. For instance, one could vote at the local level, but not in national presidential elections. Also, depending on the state, women could vote one year, and possibly the next year it would be repealed. The McKinney Courier Gazette had this to say, equal suffrage sounds better in theory than it looks in practice. In the 1890s, the image of the new woman included education and new ideas. This new woman interacted outside the home and emerged as a social force. Many women's clubs were founded in McKinney, working to establish libraries and planning for civic improvements. In 1893, the Texas Equal Rights Association, the first statewide suffrage organization, was formed in Dallas, and a congress of over 300 people met at Fair Park. They had approximately 50 members, and one-fifth were men. The majority were also members of the Christian Temperance Union. Many of the organized efforts to gain women's suffrage were expanded to other issues. Early on, there was the issue of abolition 
and later temperance. The suffrage groups would organize, then disagree on the varied issues and fall apart, only to reorganize a few years later. In 1902, the local ladies of McKinney joined with the Women's Christian Temperance Union to help win an election that would permanently close all of McKinney's saloons. Unfortunately, African American women were excluded from many suffrage organizations and were forced to form their own groups. The bicycle became a symbol for social liberty and women's rights. Women could ride it under their own power and shorter skirts became more acceptable. Bess Hurd was the first woman in McKinney to ride a bicycle. Her grandmother would describe her cycling as most undignified for a young girl. After 1910, suffrage activism increased and many resorted to a strategy of publicity, staging parades and picket lines. In Texas, both in 1911 and then again in 1913, resolutions for women's suffrage were introduced and then defeated. In March 1913, between five and 8,000 suffragists made history as they held the first nonviolent political protest and marched through Washington, D.C., attracting crowds upwards of half a million. Handmade banners of gold and yellow became the hallmark of American marches and picket lines. Women across the globe were simultaneously fighting for suffrage in their own countries. Suffragist imagery drew from mythology, especially Columbia, who was the female personification of America, or Lady Liberty. For the suffrage movement, they were the divine messengers of equality. In 1915, the Texas Association opposed to women's suffrage was formed. In a time when automobiles were rare, especially as driven by women, envoys of suffragettes drove across the country to gather signatures on their petitions. Beginning in June of 1917, over 200 suffragettes from 26 states were arrested on charges such as obstructing traffic. In 1918, Texas enacted a law to allow women to vote in primary elections. Texas suffragists seized upon the opportunity and approached the then candidate for governor, William Hobby, promising to vote for him if he and his Democratic leaders would vote for women's suffrage. In the same year that Hobby became governor, a referendum granting full voting rights to women passed through the Texas legislature, but was unfortunately rejected by the voters. Suffragists picketed the White House every day in 1919 until the 19th Amendment was finally passed by Congress. The amendment then went to the states for approval, where three quarters of the states were needed to ratify it. Texas was the ninth state and the first Southern state to ratify it. It was not until the following August of 1920 that the necessary 36 states had approved it and the 19th Amendment became part of the U.S. Constitution. The right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. Even after the 19th Amendment, the right to vote was suppressed for many. In 1962, Fannie Lou Hamer tried to register to vote and was denied on the grounds that she was illiterate. She famously said that she was sick and tired of being sick and tired. Poll taxes and literacy tests were common barriers for voters. In 1964, the 24th Amendment permanently prohibited poll taxes. Eventually, the 1965 Voting Rights Act was passed, banning literacy tests and finally protecting the right of all Americans to vote. <laughs>